We know we have a few people still taking their breaks and we'll be coming back in in a few minutes, but just in the interest of getting back on schedule, I think it would be appropriate to go ahead and begin this, our final panel of this afternoon, talking about questions of international trade. We have two panelists with us. I'm going to introduce each one of them uh, and then they're going to speak for a few minutes, uh, give some opening comments, if you would, about the current state of the, the issue. Uh, we've had some references to trade policy already this afternoon, so it would be helpful to, to uh, follow up with some more specific conversation about it. Our two guests are Brian Riley, number one. He's the director of the National Taxpayer Union's new free, freely minted, newly minted Free Trade Initiative. His background includes years of research on the impact trade has on people in the United States. He has led grassroots campaigns in support of initiatives like the North, Car North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and in opposition to special interest efforts to get the government to pick winners and losers in the American economy. Brian has been quoted in publications including the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. He's also an in-demand speaker who travels the country explaining the benefits of international trade and investment and how that helps Americans. Brian Riley grew up in Manhattan, Kansas. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Kansas State and a master's degree in economics. Oh, okay. Jayhawk. No, Wildcats. What? Oh, Kansas State. Yeah, what was I talking about? I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting confused. I'm to walk off the stage. However, I will just tell you that sports is not my strong suit. So, all right. Master's degree from the University of Southern California, the Trojans. See, I got that one right. Okay. Brian first came to Washington, D.C. as a National Taxpayers Union intern during the Reagan administration. He continues to champion President Reagan's trade vision for America and previously worked as an analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Our other speaker is Michael Stumo. He's the CEO of the Coalition for a Prosperous America, the nation's premier nonprofit organization working at the intersection of trade, jobs, tax, and economic growth issues. CPA is a bipartisan coalition of farmers and ranchers, manufacturers, and labor groups. Stumo works closely and regularly with administration officials, as well as with congressional offices, both Democratic and Republican. He appears regularly on American and international television and radio, including appearances on CNBC, Japan NK, NHK World, and the BBC World Service. His articles on trade, taxes, and economics are published in publications such as The Hill, The American Prospect, Breitbart, and Global Trade Magazine. Stumo previously worked as a lawyer and litigator at the firms of Brignol, Bush, and Lewis in Hartford, Connecticut, and Domina Law in Omaha, Nebraska. He was general counsel for the Organization for Competitive Markets, focusing on agriculture and antitrust issues. He holds a BS from Iowa State. I'm not going to try to guess the mascot. Cyclones. Okay. And has his law degree from the University of Iowa. Hawkeyes. All right. <laughs> All right. This Tar Heel will shut up. And we will hear from our uh, two distinguished panelists, and then I'll ask them a few questions to focus the discussion a little bit more, and then we will leave time for you to ask some questions at the end of the session. So, Brian, if you'll start us off. Well, thank you. I appreciate the chance to be here on this panel. Uh, I have a few brief introductory comments, but I'm not going to give a real long, uh, complex uh, discussion of trade policy because I'm more interested in the questions that you have and, and that you all have. And uh, I have only been able to participate in the previous panel and the comments that were made about trade policy earlier, I think, generally were, were widely Oh, not, they, they're very accurate, and uh, you could just take those and run with them. When I talk about trade policy to people, a lot of times there are a couple of points that, that I like to try and, and get out to, to have people think about trade maybe differently than the way it's typically uh, described in the press or by, by politicians. 
And the first is, I, I'll have different examples, and the example I'll use uh, for, for me is uh, my microwave oven broke this last week. So, to, so I'm flying back to DC tonight, and tomorrow I'm gonna go to Target or Walmart or Best Buy or somewhere and, and buy a new microwave oven. So my question is, when I go buy this microwave and spend $100 or $150, I don't know how much microwaves cost now at, 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 at Target, let's say, uh, which one of us wins and which one of us loses? in that transaction? Well, it's a silly question, isn't it? Because I win because I need a microwave, I get a microwave. Target wins because they've got a microwave to sell and they have sold the microwave. Trade is a win-win transaction. That's true when Brian goes to buy a microwave. That's true when Kroger goes to buy asparagus in the middle of winter from growers in Mexico. It's true when U.S. farmers in Kansas or Iowa sell soybeans to China. They're all win-win transactions. So thinking about trade as one person wins and one loses, I think can lead to some um, policies that are harmful to Americans. The second example, the second of two examples that I have this morning will be if I take my big fat National Taxpayers Union salary and in addition to buying a microwave uh, this weekend, I buy a new Ferrari that's made in Italy. And I, I also don't know how much a microwave or a Ferrari costs, but let's say it's $600,000. Oh, sure you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but go with me here, if I, if I buy that Ferrari from Italy and I send them $600,000 and I get the car, I have just added $600,000 to the U.S.-Italy trade deficit or to the overall U.S. trade deficit with the world. How much do any of you owe Italy because Brian just added $600,000 to the trade deficit? Nothing. The answer is zero. Trade deficit is, if I could change one thing, it would be for the government and for policy wonks like myself just to stop using the phrase trade deficit. Instead of saying net exports or trade imbalance or something like that, then we can have a nice discussion about who has unfair trade barriers and what can we do about it and how can we address it. But when you use the phrase trade deficit, any normal person who hears deficit is going to think we're losing or money's being deficit drained out of the U.S. economy. And again, this leads to some very uh, wrong policies that are bad for the United States. So trade is win-win and trade deficit does not mean dollars are being drained from the U.S. economy. And if, if you're with me and you agree with that and you understand it, you know more than the U.S. Commerce Secretary, the U.S. Trade Representative, the Chief Trade Advisor to the President of the United States. And I say that sometimes people laugh or they're, they're, they're in shock. But if you, if you look at the comments, it's all based on the trade deficit's too bad, we're losing. If they really believe that, they don't have an understanding of how things work. And I, I stress if they really believe it, because I don't know how much Politicians typically believe what they say, or they're using it to get it to get at other um, other topics. Uh, we support free trade. I'm the head of the Free Trade Initiative at the National Taxpayers Union, and just describing what free trade means to us, it just means when you earn your paychecks, you get to decide how to spend the the, the money, and somebody in D.C. doesn't get to decide how to spend the money. And I noticed your brief slip of the tongue when you talked about the North Carolina Free Trade Agreement. I like the North Carolina Free Trade Agreement. It's the U.S. Constitution, which says South Carolina can't put tariffs on your goods. North Carolina politicians. Yeah, the drawback is we can't put tariffs on South Carolina people. That's, that's well, where this starts some, to go around. Someday around. we'll get the unification of the Carolinas. <laughs> on our terms, that's okay. But. Um, and, and, and the same goes for international trade, trade as well. Free trade agreements that remove barriers, that increase economic freedom. And a lot of times I talk about uh, trade in a vacuum, but policies are all interrelated. I mentioned trade deficits, as much as I said, I, I hate that phrase, but what, what it overlooks is the money that people earn in other countries when they sell something to us. If they don't buy our exports, they invest in the United States. They build Toyota factories or they build Kia factories. That benefits us. Uh, we never, politicians rarely 
focus on that. Uh, seven, over seven million Americans work for com companies uh, around the country like Toyota, Kia, many here in North Carolina as well. If you have a dollar to invest, whether you're sitting uh, in North Carolina or Kansas or Iowa or China or Mexico, the U.S. is a pretty darn good place to invest that money. So a lot of money that might otherwise be used by U.S. exports is invested in our economy or is borrowed by the federal government. We run a big budget deficit. How are we going to finance the overspending if we're not taxing? We have to borrow it. We borrow it from Americans, or we borrow it from Europe. We borrow it from Japan. We borrow it from China. So dollars that could have been used to buy American exports are essentially spent on US Treasury bonds instead. So this does not mean that other countries, particularly China, aren't guilty of bad acts that we ought to try to do something about. But let's not blame, make the mistake of blaming other countries for policies that a lot of times are really made in the USA. All right, Brian, thank you very much. Let's hear from Michael. Thank you. So the Trump trade team with uh, the trade representative, uh, Bob Lighthizer, uh, his deputies, somewhat Wilbur Ross, somewhat his, uh, the president's trade advisor, Peter Navarro. Uh, they're mostly Hamiltonians. Uh, you don't hear this in the press. You hear chaos or you hear from the administration, we're going for leverage. We, my organization supports leverage uh, in this uh, trade wrestling match. But uh, America started what was called the American system of economics. And it started with uh, Alexander Hamilton's 1791 report on manufacturers. So this is a pamphlet. It's the Declaration of Independence. Some of you may have the US Constitution in your pocket or at home. But really, it had a big impact. It was the American system of economics should have a pamphlet like this. And there was this free trade debate is not new. It's been going on for 200 years. Uh, the American system, which Hamilton prevailed on, was to have a system of tariffs, of industrial subsidies, and a national bank with policies to promote the growth of productive enterprise rather than speculation, because you can do either with money, of course. Uh, these days, I'd modernize it to include uh, exchange rate management in this, which I'll get to. But the U.S. Uh, used, uh, implemented it to grow from being an agrarian economy to the world's economic superpower. The Germans then copied it, and then the Asians did with their own version of it in uh, the 20th century. So Hamilton was worried that uh, Britain's lead in manufacturing would re re remain intent, entrenched, uh, condemning the U.S. to be an agrarian economy, e exporting agricultural products and raw materials. And in modern terms, we would be a banana republic. And so, uh, and George Washington went along, he said in his first address to Congress, a free people should promote such manufactories as tend to render them independent of others for essential, particularly military su uh, supplies. The very second act of Congress in 1789 was the Tariff Act, declaring that the tariff was necessary for the encouragement and protection of manufacturers. Indeed, the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8, uh, gave Congress the power for tariffs, but not income tax, right? It said the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect duties, imposts, and excises. Did not give them income tax power. And so, throughout the 1800s, we had uh, mostly, uh, the government was mostly funded by tariffs and uh, uh, not the income tax. Now, Jefferson was opposed. He was a free trader at first uh, when he was president. He went along with Congress some, but then after the War of 1812, he flipped. He became uh, a, a fan of the American system of economics, too. He said in 1816, to be independent, for the comforts of life, we must fabricate them ourselves. Manufacturers are now as necessary to our independence 
as to our comfort. He said, as we, uh, uh, the re revenue from the consumption of foreign articles, with regard to that, he said, it may be the pleasure and pride of an American to ask what farmer, what mechanic, what laborer ever sees a tax gatherer in the United States. James Madison continued the policy, James Monroe did. Monroe said in 1821, it may be fairly presumed that under the protection given to domestic manufacturers by existing laws, we shall become at no distant period a manufacturing country on an extensive scale. Now, we were not that rich at the time. We could have said our citizens are really poor. We need to buy cheap goods from Europe, but we didn't. We focused on building our own industry. And we were the biggest economy in the world by the 1870. We weren't the geopolitical leader in the world, but we were the biggest economy by then. It took a while for us to become the world leader geopolitically. Monroe went on. As to the theoretical arguments of free trade, satisfied I am, whatever may be the abstract doctrine in favor of unrestricted commerce, there, there are other strong reasons which impose on us the obligation to cherish and sustain our manufacturers. Now, Karl Marx, he was a free trader. He supported free trade, but primarily for revolutionary purposes. In Brussels in 1848, he said, the protective system in these days is conservative, while the free trade system works destructively. It breaks up, free trade breaks up old nationalities and carries antagonism of proletariat and bourgeoisie to the uttermost point. In this revolutionary sense alone, I am in favor of free trade. Democrats were the free traders. They tried to replace the tariffs with the income tax throughout the late 1800s. The big push was 1894. Uh, they didn't get it done. Republicans came into office and continued to support them. Then the liberal globalist Woodrow Wilson was the first tariff cutter. And of course, we got the income tax constitutional amendment during that time. He cut tariffs uh, quite a bit and the income tax replaced it. So we, instead of getting revenue on the import side, we taxed our own citizens. But then Calvich Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge came in in the 1920s, the roaring 20s, right? We grew pretty fast. He raised with the Congress tariffs up to pre-Wilsonian levels during that, at the beginning of that growth period, hiked them. He said, our tariff enables us to pay American workmen the highest wages in the world. Before we get carried away with any visionary expectation of promoting the public welfare by a general avalanche of cheap goods from foreign sources, imported under a system which, whatever it may be called, is in reality free trade, it well, may well be first, it will be well first to count the cost and realize just what a proposal really means. I am for protection because it maintains American standards of living and business for agriculture, industry, and labor. Okay. So in 1929, we heard what happened. We know what happened. There was a stock market crash, a financial crisis. It went around the world. Just like the Great Recession in 2008, uh, countries' economies shrank. Uh, international trade shrank because countries shrank. Uh, Smoot-Hawley tariffs were put in in 1931. And the uh, global trade, of course, most countries weren't relying on global trade very much then. It was mostly their domestic economies, but it was much less than now. And the tariff levels went up to slightly above pre-Wilsonian levels. Uh, other countries, but, the, but that decade was a monetary and financial crisis. Uh, to the extent Smoot-Hawley raised tariffs on a certain swath of imports, uh, the imports dropped after 1931, 52%. There were imports that had zero duties, okay, zero, and they dropped by 51%, statistically insignificant. In fact, FDR was the first durable free trader. His Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, convinced him to start dropping tariffs, which they did in 1934 with a Democratic Congress. 
tariff rates cra uh, went way down from 34 to 41. And did we recover? No, because that wasn't the driver. It was a financial and lending crisis. It was, you have different versions of what in the monetary financial realm did it, but it wasn't trade. It took World War II to get growth and trade going again. Okay, but by then all the presidents became free traders, tariff cutters. Truman said, U.S. industry now dominates the world and need not fear low priced labor. Eisenhower said, all problems of local industry pale in significance in relation to the world crises. Of course, we were 60% of the world economy then. We're 30% now. We were the last man standing, so to speak. But then the Germans, Friedrich List, he was a German economist. He was, had dual American citizenship, and he was a devotee of Hamilton. Remember, you may remember that Germany was a separate, a bunch of German states until the unification of 1870. He urged, uh, supported free trade as we do among the states, the German states, but imposing tariffs on imported goods and stated the cost of a tariff should be seen as an investment in the nation's future productivity. In quotes, the result of a general free trade would not be a universal republic, but on the contrary, a universal subjection of the less advanced nations to the predominant manufacturing, commercial, and naval power, which was, of course, Britain. Okay. He said, a, the, a society's well-being and wealth should not be to, are not determined by what the society can buy, but by what it can produce. Japan was influenced by List. They grew to be a global power for World War II, got crashed, of course, because they were the losers, and then were built up by tariffs, industrial subsidies, coordination between the government and their, their, their keiretsu industries, their national champion, plus currency undervaluation. South Korea, post-Korean post War, was a war-torn, poverty-stricken agrarian economy. They used tariffs, subsidies, their own Japanese-style coordination with their national champions of Hyundai, uh, Samsung, their Chai Bowl system, uh, and an undervalued currency to make their goods cheap and imports expensive to go to be a significant industrial power. China, we were, you remember in the 1970s, here, donate to this fund, feed the poor Chinese. Um, they used their own version, Hamilton plus List plus, you know, an improvement on state capitalism, the Soviet model. They uh, devalued their currency by 40% in 1994 when we implemented the NAFTA. They, remember, China, when China was poor, they overconsumed and underproduced, and they had to rely on imported products and the like. They were poor. But the, they devalued made everything, uh, we didn't hear much about it, but it made everything we sold to them 40% more expensive, made everything they sell to us 40% cheaper, and they implemented their five-year plans. They targeted these industries, which, by the way, were government-owned and still are. Steel was one of them early on, aluminum, some basic industries. Now they're up to automotive, aerospace, AI, the like, China 2025. They're, they're, they're uh, relentless. So. No country in the world went from poverty status to industrial power through free trade. Germany in the 1990s was known as the sick man of Europe. They, they over, over consumed, underproduced. They were a problem for the European economy. When they joined the Eurozone in 2002, they exchanged the Deutschmark for the Euro at a very advantageous rate, and so they effectively devalued. And so their goods were cheaper, and they did some reforms to keep their labor costs down, their productivity high, ended up being a net exporter to peripheral Europe. They overproduced, exported their overcapacity to peripheral Europe, Greece, Italy, Spain, that employed Germans, displaced Italy, Spain, Greek folks, Greece crashed, they couldn't devalue their currency because they had a Eurozone, and so they had to do bank bailouts. Spain and Italy are still suffering, now German overcapacity comes uh, to the United States. 
So the modern, the modern scenario of the trade imbalances is that you have a few countries that are uh, the trade surplus countries, Germany, Japan, South Korea, and China, all of them have their own version of industrial policy with a exchange rate devaluation, uh, industrial uh, policies, and, and tariffs uh, when, they, when they developed. Uh, South Korea cut them with the, uh, with the Korea uh, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, but they overwhelmed them with some of the other policies with the subsidies and the, and the devaluation. So a key turning point for us was in 1970s when we went off the gold standard and the dollar became the new reserve currency. And that's something that the Trump administration should pay some attention to because we've had 43 straight years of trade deficits and deindustrialization where we overconsumed and underproduced. And people say, well, it's just our moral failing, right? But the Chinese used to do it. They devalued, now they do the opposite. I mean, Confucius culture has been the same for 3,000 years. It was that policy change. Same with Germany. It's the sick man of Europe to the roaring Germany of now. So the dollar became the world currency, so everyone had to own dollars around the world because to conduct international trade, we're a safe harbor, whatever. So we performed the service of printing the, the currency that the world uses to trade. So then, for free. So they, they bid the dollar up, so we have inflows of capital, pushing the dollar up so we're overvalued and it devalues all goods and services because they buy them in dollars, so we're overpriced as opposed to the Chinese or the South Koreans, which are underpriced. And Nixon had the first trace deficits that started being persistent, and he was upset, and he told his administration, fix this, but they couldn't. Then Reagan faced the biggest trade deficits in US history at the time, and he had a lot of pressure. He and James Baker, Reagan fixed it for a time, he and James Baker got the West Germans. You remember Japan Inc., they were eating our lunch, right? All the books. They were a currency manipulator, and I just told you their strategy. So he got them in the Plaza Hotel in New York City, and he made them and the Germans devalue the dollar and revalue their own currencies. The, you know, the yen dollar ratio went de uh, reval you know, 60 percent revaluation of the yen, and within four or five years, we had balanced trade. And then at Clinton beyond didn't didn't care about it. So the Trump administration gets this. Trade imbalances are uh, destabilizing to the world. China, with their special case, they're a state capitalism model. Some of the others are sort of benign surplus countries overproducing and dumping their overcapacity on deficit countries. China is far more strategic and they are a geopolitical threat. The administration started uh, with their Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum on national security grounds. People say, pshaw, steel and aluminum, national security. China named it a national security industry in their five-year plans. Other countries name it such in their plans. Germany, J uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, Turkey, Brazil, they all implicitly or explicitly name those industries, national security, and they protect them from Chinese dumping, the only major steel and aluminum power that allows dumping of Chinese overcapacity of steel into their country is us, no one else, okay? Then he did the 301 tariffs to fix China's comprehensive intellectual property theft and technology transfer. Started with $50 billion, they're on the way. China, rather than changing, uh, threat and retaliation, so Trump said, okay, you don't want to change, we'll do another 100 billion. Okay, so they're in process. Now, fast forward to the Hamiltonians of today. Dennis Shea is the ambassador to the WTO. He's China challenging us at the WTO for our 301 tariffs. They had an exchange this week in Geneva. By many reports, it was the tensest exchange that has ever been at the WTO in Geneva. Okay, and China's saying we're protectionist. Okay, so Dennis Shea says, we have now entered the realm of Alice in Wonderland. White is black, up is down. It is amazing to watch a country that is the world's most protectionist, mercantilist economy position itself as the self-proclaimed defender of free trade and the global trading system. 
The WTO must avoid falling down this rabbit hole into a fantasy world lest it lose all credibility. The truth is, it is China that is the unilateralist consistently acting in ways that undermine the global system of open and fair trade. Market access barriers, too numerous to mention. Forced technology transfers. Intellectual property theft on an unprecedented scale. Indigenous innovation policies in the Made in China 2025 program. Discriminatory use of technical standards. Massive government subsidies that have led to chronic overcapacity in key industrial sectors. And a highly restrictive foreign investment regime. These are the issues that should be on today's agenda. If the WTO wishes to remain relevant, it must, with urgency, confront the havoc created by Chinese, China's state capitalism. So we can expect this move and counter move system to continue, as David Rouser said today. It'll probably be 10 years of disruption, but we have to rebalance this because they will surpass us. They will not be such a benign superpower and global policeman as we have been. They do not share our values. And if we're fine being displaced as the global superpower and being uh, under them, then let's keep going. If not, there has to be some disruption to change. So the free trade debate is not new. The Trumpians are Hamiltonians, and we can expect more of this. All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions, some of which have been touched on, but I just wanna focus the conversation, get a little more uh, clash, perhaps, on a couple of specifics. The obvious one to start with is NAFTA. Do you think, both of you, uh, do you think NAFTA has been on balance a positive or a net negative? And as the Trump administration is currently negotiating uh, under some threat or suggestion that NAFTA might, that, that the president might pull out of NAFTA, it's not, if it's not renegotiated quickly, what should those provisions look like? What should NAFTA look like in the future if we're going to have it? So let's start with Brian. So just a reminder, NAFTA is a policy that originated with President Reagan's 1979 campaign announcement when he said, I want to have a common accord between the three North American countries where goods will flow more freely uh, between the three countries just like they flow between the 50 states. That's the direction I think uh, that we should head with respect to NAFTA. And I think it's been something that has benefited the U.S. tremendously. Look, if you're worried about China, no one would be more happy to see the U.S. pull out of NAFTA than the leaders in China. We risk falling behind as other countries move forward with trade agreements if we don't continue, not just either, at least if we don't expand our agreements with other countries, we sure shouldn't be pulling out of them. Uh, manufacturing output in the U.S. is up like a trillion dollars since NAFTA was, was passed. Not all because of NAFTA, but it added economic growth in the United States and it encouraged other countries around the world to pursue uh, similar trade liberalization. And I don't know how many people here are concerned about immigration. But I've talked to a lot of groups and, the, and, and it's, it's a big concern. Uh, if, if you can imagine a scenario that we have today where the leading presidential candidate in Mexico is somebody who's praised Fidel Castro, who's compared U.S. investors in Mexico to pirates, and you marry that with the U.S. potentially pulling out of NAFTA, well, do you think we have an immigration problem now? You have no idea compared to what we're going to have down the road. Um, NAFTA has been a win-win. Wages are up in all three countries. We, it should be improved. It should be modernized. U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer, a year ago, when he went to Congress, said, we're going to modernize NAFTA. And then he engaged in negotiations, which really aim largely at taking the free out of free trade agreements. One of the uh, things I like about trade agreements is something that's taken from the U.S. Constitution, which is the idea that government should not be able to confiscate private property without providing compensation. That's something that's in NAFTA. 
and the U.S. negotiators have said, no, we want to take that out. We want to make it easier to put tariffs on fresh fruit and vegetables coming from Mexico. We want to raise domestic content requirements to make it more expensive to build cars in the United States. The entire U.S. automobile industry is opposed to this. Uh, a lot of agreements that First of all, it's not clear Mexico and Canada will sign on. And second of all, it's not clear that Congress would even pass those changes to NAFTA. The, the, um, the, it would be essentially done as a threat where you need to take this, what I would call, um, lesser NAFTA agreement or we're just going to pull out it entirely. And I don't think that's any way to, uh, to lead. We should be looking for win-win agreements that create more opportunities. and. I, I'm an economist, so I talk about economics and GDP and manufacturing output. But if you think back to what Mexico was like prior to 1994, when NAFTA was enacted, to after, you know, it's a country that has a long way to, to go, a, a lot of problems, but certainly uh, one that's made dramatic progress um, in large part because of reforms that NAFTA has encouraged. All right. Uh, NAFTA, net positive or net negative, and what should it look like in the future? Uh, net negative, probably overrated uh, by, by the side that thinks it's a positive and the side that thinks it's a negative. Uh, Mexico was doing, uh, so we, on net, we lost jobs uh, post-NAFTA uh, and, de and degraded the quality of our employment because so much of the high-wage, high-hour uh, jobs, full-time jobs, went to Mexico. Uh, and we did replace with lower, uh, lower quality jobs, service sector jobs, tends to, and that's been the story of our deindustrialization trend. You, you, if you get the jobs back, they tend to be low quality jobs, frappuccino servers at 12 bucks an hour and 18 hours a week. On the job count, that counts the same as a full-time job. So the quality of jobs goes down as you deindustrialize. The, we had an $8 billion surplus with Mexico the year before NAFTA went into place. We have a $60 billion deficit last year, okay? Um, that's not a win. Uh, the ideal is balance. It's not a trade versus no trade position, it's a balance. So Mexico was doing well, and then they were implementing, uh, going to implement the NAFTA, and Mexico is probably doing as well as it ever had in its history. And then the, they, they got the NAFTA deal in 93, and the Mayan rebels came out of the jungle and said, we don't like it, you're going to you know, harm us. And then subcommandante uh, Marcos, uh, ended up, you know, the, the presidential candidate at that time in Mexico, got assassinated. Subcommander Marcos sent a letter to the new uh, presidential candidate for the PRI, welcome to hell. Uh, they had a lot of problems there. They had a peso crisis, so the peso crashed in value, and they've never recovered. Uh, so the imbalance is largely driven by the peso crisis that never recovered and the dollar's overvaluation, so that differential, that's most of it. Tariffs have a... So the way to think about trade, uh, most news, I mean, we've heard up here, there, there's fake trade news too. The way to think about trade is in, in three tiers, right? Volume of trade, balance of trade, composition of trade. Global volume of trade is purely a function of whether countries are growing or not. Tariffs don't matter, exchange rate mat don't, doesn't matter. It's, if the world's growing, trade is going to grow. Balance of trade is mostly an exchange rate issue. Is your currency high or low and driving your, your trade to balance? Tariffs have very little to do with that, the balance of trade. I didn't believe that two years ago. I was waterboarded with the facts, <laughs> right? Um, you can plot high and low tariff countries around the world and you can find no correlation with a trade surplus or a trade deficit. So, okay. Tariffs do have a, a, some matter for composition of trade. So if you put a tariff on steel and aluminum, you will slow those imports, but then imports and exports and exchange rates will sort of flow around and you'll end up with the same balance of trade, but you'll have more steel production. So if that's part of your economic plan to, to, to help steel, it's going to probably work, but it won't change your balance of trade. So with Mexico, we're not going to change the balance of trade with uh, tariffs high or low. We saw with the Smoot-Hawley 
or whatever, the, the data doesn't support the outsized impact on trade balance that everyone uh, says. And I diverge a little bit with the administration on this one. Uh, but I do think it's, uh, it, it is proven data-wise that the composition of trade, which you want to have high-value industries, a lot of value add. You don't want to be a subcontinent of Asia or Middle Eastern, just a raw material exporter and import. You know, you want to do semiconductors. You want to do advanced products that are innovative and do the jobs of the future, that sort of thing. So in a way, uh, you know, I'd like to get, if, it, if I was king, I'd get rid of NAFTA and reorganize the global trading system around solid principles like that. Now, as to labor, the Mexican wages did not go up. They are more stagnant than any other OECD country, okay? You would have expected that you'd have wage convergence because you put a high wage market and a low wage market together. The US, you have wages converge. So the low wage country comes up like China has. The high wage country comes down to convergence. So it sucks to be us and it's great to be them, but it didn't work out for either. Our deficit's been driven by auto and auto parts, electronics and machinery, though there's a big deficit drivers. In the auto and auto parts sector, the auto workers that kept their jobs had their wages devalued by 26%, okay, in relation to 1994. So it hurts. Michael, All right. I, 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 yep. I thought I heard you say we have fewer jobs and we're getting paid less than we did in 1994. Is it, did I misunderstand? In we affected have few, industries? We, we have, in the affected work? industries, Okay, so when we have unemployment, so, so the imports destroy jobs. When you have uh, unemployment, uh, you don't get them back. Or you get some back, but they're lower quality. When you have full employment, you get jobs churning back, but because we're deindustrializing, they tend to be lower quality jobs than before. You mean deindustrializing N not that we have lower manufacturing output, we surely do not. You mean we have 12 it's, 12 percent of our economy is manufacturing, uh, and it's a decline from 20 to 25 percent. You know, 50 years ago, the but you the, mean the it's successful less labor intensive. No, no, no. Uh, Germany, South Korea, uh, Japan, they have 24 to 30 percent of their economy is manufacturing. And so that's where you get the productivity increases in manufacturing. You need productivity increases as a condition precedent of getting wage increases. So as we lose manufacturing and the productivity and the innovation, our productivity has become flat and our job quality, the new jobs created have tended to been more below the median non-supervisory wage than when you had uh, a higher proportion of manufacturing. So job quality suffers. All right, Brian, response? Uh, it's easy, and I hear this in DC all the time, manufacturing jobs good, service jobs bad. And in fact, there's Not less for and me. less Not differentiation for me. between manufacturing and service jobs. They increasingly go together. Some manufacturing jobs are better than some service jobs. Um, I've never had to sit on an assembly line and glue shoes together all, all, all day long. Um, I suspect those aren't the kinds of jobs that are coming back or that we would necessarily want to have come back. And if Mexico or China or Vietnam can make the shoes and we have more doctors and nurses and engineers and uh, those kinds of jobs, that's how we progress, whether it's due to new technologies or whether it's due to international trade. And looking around the world, you, you look at the countries that are most prosperous and those that are least prosperous. Those that are most prosperous have the most economic freedom. And that goes for trade and investment policy as well. Those that are most open to international trade, most open, open to investment, have the most competitive industries. People are better off. Uh, versus, well, we're just going to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. So, so I, I think the idea that we'll have somebody in D.C. Uh, dictate what the economy should look like is not the direction that, I, that uh, has been proven to work. All right, I'm going to ask uh, questions of each, each of you based on your initial uh, uh, remarks and, uh, and, and the remarks of the other person. So let me start with you, Brian. Uh, Michael made the argument 
uh, observing the history over the last couple of hundred years, that a number of emerging economies, America being an emerging economy in the early 19th century, uh, other economies coming along later, sometimes after war, sometimes just as part of sort of joining the international economic community, that many of them erected tariff walls and developed industries behind those walls, uh, and that uh, there really aren't examples of countries progressing into the modern age, into the top flight of uh, economic powerhouses without staying behind those uh, tariff or currency or other kinds or industrial policies of various kinds to foster uh, in the industrial base that makes the, the modern uh, economy work. Well, first of all, let me say, if, if we're having a discussion on let's get rid of the entire income tax system and raise tariffs a little bit, I think I probably could, could agree with Michael uh, going going that direction. Uh, the income tax has led to, uh, obviously, uh, allowed the federal government to expand dramatically. We should, look, we should talk afterward, maybe. All right. <laughs> I, like, I like to find areas of agreement. Um, but maybe it's more entertaining to have disagreement. But when I look at U.S. history, and you think, for example, of the Declaration of Independence, and everybody on the list of grievances remembers the line, uh, he's imposed taxes on us uh, without uh, taxation, without representation. And I don't know if any of you are carrying your Declaration of Independence with you. I'm not carrying mine with me. But the line above that, the, the grievance, <laughs> don't, <laughs> The Declaration, not Alexander Hamilton's <laughs> report on manufacturers. Uh, the line above that is, he has cut off our trade with all parts of the world. So the opposition to the interference with our freedom to trade is, is part of American history. The, the Constitution, as I mentioned earlier, we went from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. One reason for that was that you had states imposing their, they had their own agreements with other countries, and they're also restricting trade with each other. So we had free trade between the states, which was the most important trade, because at the time, uh, distances and technology was a lot harder to get goods back and forth from Europe, India, China than, than it is today. So free trade is actually something which I would say has really benefited the United States. And I, and I would ask also, show of hands, anybody here from the University of North Carolina? You mean graduates or? Graduates. Oh, OK. Graduates. So anybody here from NC State? OK. You go to the website when you get home and go to the Department of Economics, and you pull up the list of faculty members, and you just close your eyes, and you point at one, and you email him, and you say, would it be a good idea for the US to pull out of NAFTA? Or you go to the next one down, and you say, is it a good idea for us to increase uh, tariffs on steel by 25%. And I know what they're going to say. This is not particularly controversial among economics, among, among, among economists. Uh, the, the track record shows, both in terms of economic theory and history, the countries that are most prosperous are those that give people the most freedom, not that allow the government to start picking winners and losers. This morning I was looking online, and there's a uh, Henderson, North Carolina, uh, boat manufacturer, they make tanks out of aluminum. And they hired a lawyer. By the way, one of the big boom industries in DC is trade lawyers and lobbyists. Um, they hired a lawyer to try and get an exemption to aluminum tariffs. And uh, part of their filing was the move by Department of Congress pits one set of US manufacturers against others. And that's all this does, is it gives power to the government to pick winners and losers based on who has the most political clout. There's no way that's good for the United States. All right, so Michael, I've got a question for you. Um, you said in a number of uh, points in your opening statements that Germany has overproduced or China has overproduced or various countries have overproduced. Who says exactly? What does it mean to have something be overproduced compared to what? What is, what is the right level of production and who says? Right, so <clears throat> there's a book called The Great Rebalancing by Michael Pettis, University of, uh, uh, he's a Carnegie Fellow, American, he actually teaches in Beijing, but 
The reason, and by the way, uh, with all due respect to Brian, I note that he could not cite a country that went from poor to rich with free trade. China cut its tariffs from 35% to about 4%, and they gave people to keep more of what they earned, and they went from a backwards country to one that is still backwards, but it moved in the right direction. And I'm sorry I interrupted you, but go ahead. <laughs> no, it's, it's fair, it's fair, it's, uh, it's what makes it entertaining. So uh, China's the free trader, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that China cut tariffs from 35% so, before okay. it joined the World Trade Organization to about 4 or 5% today. I'm not in any way uh, as, uh, asserting that China is a free market capitalist uh, economy. So what uh, the U.S. consumes about, it's about 68% of our GDP is based on consumption. Okay, Germany, that's... Uh, is about 60 to 63. So you have consumption, you have investment, you have government procurement, you have net trade. What China did, when you suppress consumption growth in relation to production, you get overproduction. So your own economy on net, that doesn't mean you're not buying and selling. I'm talking about on net. You're pretty, you, you have macro policies that force the consumption down in relation to production. For example, in China, they use financial repression. You cannot, you cannot um, uh, get credit cards to consume more. Uh, your savings have to be in a state bank where you get very low interest rates. And they channel, so when you save, you go to the bank, but then the state channels all that investment to the state-owned enterprises, which then produce a lot. And the consumers in China cannot consume what they produce. Um, so you have in, in steel in so many sectors, you know, we invented LED lighting. We have one or two plants. They had 300, okay, plants over there. When they supercharge it, they really do it. When they do, you know, steel over capacity, the, the world was, you know, had over capacity in 05 and they put another 500 million metric tons per year into production. It's just astounding and they just dump it. And they take everyone and they, they print the money to keep that thing going. So they're the most extreme. So Germany has the biggest net export status at 8.5% of GDP of any country in the world because of their unique position in, uh, uh, in, in the euro where the different currencies can't rebalance. But they're at 60 to 63% of consumption as a percentage of GDP. China's at 35% or 40% of their GDP is consumption. So there's a certain range, it's like your blood pressure range, or it's like, you know, what should your endocrine levels be in your blood, or something, you know, some, uh, sort of uh, uh, hematocrit levels, or that sort of thing. When you're out of the range, something's really wrong, and, it, and it's not natural, and, it, and it's forced. So the exchange rates are the modern tool. The exchange rates are a tariff or a tax on your consumers. So when Japan is, we think they're 23% undervalued, that their consumers are taxed. But the reason other countries intervene in trade to get a trade advantage is because the boost to employment and wages exceeds the loss in production. Okay, so that's, that's how they grow. We over, uh, we're an open economy and when other countries that have more control over their economy make these strategies to hold back consumption a bit to advantage their production side, the exchange rates and all that, and they have that overproduction, it flows in here because we're open. And when Wilbur Ross was in Davos and all the Davos billionaires, that's, that's, that's the Davos, you know, is a place where the millionaires tell the billionaires what the middle class thinks, right? And, uh, <laughs> And he sat up there and they're all thinking, oh, he's gonna, you know, these are the guys that don't even care about borders. The world is their oyster, right? They're total globalists. But he said, you know, you guys uh, complaining about our protectionism, isolationism. Name one country that's more open than the United States. One. And nobody could do it. All right, well, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. If, if you have any, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, do we have a mic? That's all right. Yeah, do we need a mic? I don't know. Maybe for the recording purposes the recording, we do. Probably, so let's yeah. wait for the microphone. John will wrestle it from its sheath there and scoot it over to you. It will be. 
Didn't want to give you a live mic, John, because, you know. Very interesting commentary. Let's try to tie it together. Foreign policy is really the key here. And these are probably tools that we can use to take the war to China, make them implode, take the war to Iran, make it implode, take the war to Cuba, make it implode, take some threats off of the map. How do we use your tools to do that? So we're, we, we had a, uh, a $550 billion total trade deficit last year, including goods and services. It was $800 million in goods, tradable goods, and I discount services in part. There's some good service jobs, but China, we have a net surplus with China services, but 57% of the services we sell to China are tourism, right? So it's Las Vegas travel, Disneyland, and the like. Fine, you get some, you know, hotel janitors and that sort of thing employed and whatever. But the tradable goods is important. We had five. So that money funds China. It's a net inflow to them. The, the, the money comes back to the US in capital inflows, but it goes mostly to treasury bonds. So flyover country gets gutted, and it goes to treasury bonds because we don't have production to pay, you know, to what, what grow is for the, debt. What is the money spent for when they purchase treasury bonds? When, when, when the Chinese purchase treasury bonds, that's a cash inflow of the federal government, right? Uh, it's a cash and inflow to our on? bond. For us? Yeah, I mean, because obviously we we're not inflow. burning the money, you know, the national No, we bond. have debt, and we're selling them bonds, which is an obligation to repay in the future. Uh -huh. yeah. So you're saying they are investing in the United States by buying bonds. The cash is coming in. What happens to the cash at that point? Where does it go? It goes to the Treasury Social to pay Security. our debt. Yeah, it, it goes pays. to Medicare. Right. It goes to Medicaid. It is expended right. for consumption in the United States. Right. Okay. Just so Germany, which has a trade surplus, has a balanced budget because they don't need to uh, borrow like we do, right? So the money has to come back, but we, f we fund their military rise, right? We fund, as we heard earlier today, their military rise is even faster than their economic rise, okay? So we, we harvest, for Japan, you know, they're just fighting their demographic bubble coming, right? They're trying to keep going as they, as they age and don't let... You know, they, they've got a problem there. But China, we, we, we get uh, that plus the tech theft, so they're smarter with their military rise. So we're getting, you know, increasing military aggression in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the like. We would never have done that with Russia, right? We would never have engaged with the Soviet Union, uh, I'll correct it, Soviet Union, so as to trade with them, help them rise, give a net inflow for their industrial sector so they could challenge us on the world stage. But we are with China. And so right, let's, uh, let's hear from Brian, and we'll get to the next question after well, that. So there are plenty of people in flyover country or, or pork producers in North Carolina, soybean farmers in the Midwest, uh, uh, spirit aircraft manufacturers in Wichita, where I lived for a few years, who are happy to sell their goods f to people in China, and China's happy to buy those goods. Uh, I think it's important that our trade agreements are not solely thought of as diplomatic tools, but they need to be structured to be in our economic interest as well. I think one of the things we can do to help with respect to countries like China is to have stronger economic relationships with our friends and allies around the world instead of picking fights with Japan and Canada and Korea and Germany and, and France. I think that's one way we can have a more united front to address some of the problems that, that really are out there as opposed to just unilaterally you know, saying, we don't like this trade deficit, so we're gonna increase taxes on Americans by X billion dollars. I don't think, I think that is the wrong way to go. But Brian, one, one might argue that China, for example, has already picked the fight with its rampant violation of intellectual property and that sort of a thing. They're, we're not picking a fight with them, we're responding to the fight they picked with us. So one of the concerns that the administration and, and some businesses have with China is that if you want to do business with China, you have to agree to transfer your technology to them. Or if you go there, they're going to steal your technology. So there's one easy solution to that if you're a company based in the United States, is you don't go to China, right? So I'm not talking about things like cybersecurity theft and everything else, but these big corporations, they have the Excel spreadsheets 
and they say, well, we're going to go there, we're going to make this much dollars, uh, we're going to lose this much te technology, and it's a voluntary choice that we want to make. It's, it doesn't mean China should be doing this, but the interesting thing to me is if all of a sudden tomorrow morning China says we're going to stop stealing intellectual property and we're going to res respect property rights and we're going to make it easier for those U.S. companies to do business here, which I think is what the administration says they want, you can have an enormous amount of jobs and offshoring from the United States to China because they're making China an even better place to do business. Uh, let me back up. I think there's an importance in, disti in dis distinguishing between legitimate problems. You, you've listed, you both listed some legitimate problems and how do we address those as opposed to running around saying, well, we have an $800 billion trade deficit and just, that needs to go down by $200 billion or else we're going to, that, that, that gets us nowhere. All right. Got another question and let's make sure we wait for the mic. So, shoot, John, choose your. Uh, for Brian, uh, s suppose we spend $100,000 for some Chinese goods and they get in return that those dollars. I think the question is, goes beyond that. What do, you, what do they do with those dollars? One is they might buy treasury bonds, and that's OK. But they also might buy companies here. I think that's one of the, uh, uh, the concerns, that they buy. Co and with those companies, they can uh, get intellectual property and so forth. Uh, uh, how would you address that? I agree with you, and uh, I, I believe the, the default should be we're going to respect Americans' property rights. So the idea if a company has a good they want to sell or they have an innovation, that the default should be that is yours and you decide what you want to do with it, subject to a legitimate national defense concern. And then we have a process called CFIUS, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and uh, Congress is right now looking at does that need to be updated to make sure what you just described does not happen. Um, but it's, it's easy to overreact and say, well, if China buys Smithfield, that's, uh, that's, a, that's against our national security. Well, you know, you've got to draw we, the line we somewhere. We take bacon very seriously in North Carolina. Just, <laughs> just, just warning you, be careful, tread lightly. Right, so, so, <laughs> so the answer is yes, we should be concerned about that. Just as with international, with our exports, I would be concerned if we lost our ability to produce steel or aluminum. And then, then sure, let's take a look at it. But, but let's not overreact and say, well, um, now we're going to shut off steel imports from around the world or we're going to clamp down on investment in areas that if they do not have legitimate national security concerns. It's, it's a real concern. That, to me, the challenge is how do you get at the real risks versus the, the um, just political risks. I was, when I was visiting Kansas, I was uh, one of my college alums just got laid off from MoneyGram because they were going to be bought by a Chinese company. And the federal government said, no, bad for security reasons. I don't know if it's good, bad for security or, or otherwise. But it was also a, a negotiating point for a US company that didn't want to have to compete with the Chinese. Uh, investor in order to get a, a better deal. So we, we just have to balance those things and not overreact. But uh, uh, as much of a free trader as I am, I want to be very clear that we need to protect our security. And I think one of the ways we protect our security is being involved in the international trading s system and having friendly relations with our trading partners makes them less likely to want to, to go to war with us and vice versa. Yeah. Thank you. Michael, you get the last word. Sure. So um, we would never tolerate what China does in their country if we try to impose it here. Imagine if other countries came here and we said, you cannot sell here unless you manufacture here. You cannot manufacture here unless you joint venture with one of our companies owned by the government. And in some cases, you cannot even do that unless you have interesting technology to, come, uh, to bring with you. Okay? That's what they do. We would never tolerate. Why do we defend that over there and say we are maybe overreacting? We just have a blind spot. We would never tolerate that here. Uh, they f we would never to tolerate when they come over, forcing them to license their technology at bargain basement rates. Otherwise, they can't come in or sell. We'd never tolerate 
the hacking of their private companies and then delivering it to our national champion industries, Boeing or whatever. Um, they would never allow us to go over there and buy their, uh, their, their critical, their companies that have critical defense technology. Can you imagine the Chinese selling us their companies with critical defense technology? I mean, you'd look at me like I'm from the moon. They don't, but we allow it. CFIUS is a partial solution. Canada has restrictive rules on foreign investment. It's weaponized incoming investment. Oh, foreign investment's good. It's not. Okay, and when the money comes back to bonds and the like, that's where you get the dichotomy of Wall Street likes the free trade and open markets, but Main Street and flyover country that's got it doesn't because it sucks out of there and it goes to dollar assets, which Wall Street likes and Treasury secretaries like when they are trying to uh, sell debt because we can't balance our budget because we don't have an economy. Okay, that's what happened in England. They built, they were built on a pre-Hamiltonian version of mercantilism and then London financial financiers won the, uh, won the argument and they declined with deindustrialization and we surpassed them. It's a classic Wall Street, Main Street. It's been going on for 200 years. So this, this is serious stuff. We didn't have to be here. We don't have the resolve to handle these threats uh, like we did under the Soviet Union. And we've got to get our head on straight with regard to balance of trade because it's meaningful as to how you are going, if, whether you're going to have an economy in 20 years. All right. Well, thank uh, thanks to both of our panelists. I know we had a couple of questions that m maybe wanted to be asked, but we're up against our time constraint. We have a reception coming up in just a few minutes, but I'm sure the panelists would hang around for a few minutes if you'd like to ask them specific questions and. Uh, uh, we'll see you in a few minutes at the Thank reception. You.